So in Mexico, in the 1934 to 1940, you have Lázaro Cárdenas. And he was actually a good president who actually cared for the people, which is rare. Remember with Benito Juárez and, and Porfirio Díaz. Uh, Lázaro Cárdenas, he actually uh, fought in the revolution, became governor of Michoacán at the age of 39, became a, a Revolutionary Party's presidential candidate, very young. He campaigned through Mexican countryside, visiting remote villages. And the good thing is that he never forgot about those villagers, the villages that he visited. And he actually would do things for them after becoming president, which is very rare with all these leaders, right? They were, a lot of them were looking into their own benefits and not through the benefits of the people. And during the six years in office, he distributed almost 45 million acres of land. He supported labor organizations and rights to strike. He would always side with the worker instead of the foreign uh, companies, which is unheard of with the leaders, you know, that are corrupt. And he supported worker strikes against the British and the U.S. oil companies. Um, when the company strikers submitted their dispute to the government, the arbitrators awarded the workers the increase in pay in social services. And the foreign owners refused to pay, even going to Supreme Court, though. And Cardenas decreed the expropriation, which is the government taking over uh, for the properties for public use, becoming part of the government, of the oil companies in accord with the Article 27 of the Mexican Constitution. And the rise of national oil company, which is called Femex, and the railroads were already nationalized in 1937. Um, so what happens with the U.S. and Latin America at this time? They had friendly relations. Remember Theodore Roosevelt, who created the Panama Canal and all that, was the uncle of Franklin D. Roosevelt. And Franklin Roosevelt, it's friendly. He will do things that are good for Latin America, unlike his bad uncle, right? So in the 1930s, the need of allies announced a good naval policy towards Latin America. So in 1933, at the Congress of Pan-American Movement, um, Franklin Roosevelt uh, representatives publicly swore off military intervention. Very different from the, you know, what his uncle did uh, with the corollary, if you remember, right? And in addition, Cuba and Panama were no longer to be protectorates of the U.S. Marines and could come and go at will, right? The U.S. and Latin America became friendlier, and after the United States entered the war, all the countries in Latin America joined as allies to help the U.S. Uh, some of the first countries to join were beneficiaries of U.S. military intervention, pro-U.S. dictators. Um, and you will see Rafael Trujillo and... Um, the Dominican Republic, Argen Argentina, and Chile were last to integrate. In Brazil, they say, was the most helpful ally because they allowed the U.S. military bases and airstrips in the Atlantic and also sent infantry uh, division to fight in Italy with the U.S. troops. Uh, so World War, II, World War II became stimulus to the IC. Government spending for war production brought u.s industry back to life building tanks and bombers u.s demand for latin american agricultural exports also recovered and the legacy of racial hierarchy was disintegrating they say and the palace of government in mexico uh, had the mural of diego rivera this is a mural that is three stories high and shows the achievements of the indigenous in Mexico and the evils of colonizations all over the walls of the National Palace in Mexico City. The black dancers of Rio de Janeiro exponents, uh, they become the exponents of Me uh, Brazilian national culture. The phonograph, radio, and cinema made a great Argentinian singer of tango. His name was Carlos Gardel, very famous. I'm going to post a little video of his song um, that you can watch. Uh, he, he had a really nice voice. And he be, when he was becoming famous and was reaching the peak, his, pla his plane crashed in the Columbia mountainside and he died tragically. Very young. I think he was 28 years old at the time. 
1945, Gabriela Mistral becomes the first woman from Latin America to win the Nobel Prize for Literature from Chile. So there were a lot of people who were pro-U.S. Uh, presidents. So the nationalism, easy, and the growth of an urban middle class had left some parts of Latin America untouched. Like Central America still ruled by oligarchies, Guatemala, the coffee growers were German. Jorge Ubico, a liberal authoritarian, he promoted the cultivation and exportation uh, of co coffee. And he wanted to have the U.S. as the closest ally. So the United Fruit Company became uh, the main single dominant economic enterprise in Guatemala at the time. In El Salvador, dictator Maximiliano Hernandez defended El Salvador's King Coffee with brutality that in 1932 is known as the year of the slaughter. Uh, the, most of the victims at the times were indigenous and there were more than 10,000 people who got slaughtered. And he was defending the coffee king, the owner, against the indigenous. And being Indian became dangerous at the time. They said that they hid their ethnic identity to blend in and they would call themselves mestizos and never indigenous because you could be a victim of a slaughter who um, they're protecting the king coffee. So you see all these people who you will see on this list are pro-US presidents, meaning that they were puppets who will do anything for the US, for their own benefits, not for the benefit of the people. So you have Fulgencio Batista in Cuba, Anastasio Somoza in, in Nicaragua, and Rafael Trujillo in the Dominican Republic. They will do anything that the US will ask them to do. So you can imagine how the foreign president was presence was during that time. Somoza and Trujillo are known for the greed, corruption, and obedience to the US. And it goes several generations, for example, for Anastasio Somoza, which you will see in the next chapter that talks about uh, Nicaragua. Trujillo renamed the capital city after himself. Because instead of being uh, Santo Domingo, it was Trujillo, and with an electric sign saying God and Trujillo. So you could imagine how um, you know self-absorbed this man was. His most national undertaking was the massacre of the Haitian immigrants. They had racism against Haitians in the Dominican Republic, which is very sad. So despite the popularity of indigenismo and mestizo nationalism, racist attitudes still remained in Latin America as there was a you know, dividing social class as well. Shanty towns constructed by rural immigrants in search of uh, industrial jobs, they came to the city and they developed in the outskirts of major Latin American cities, as you can see in this picture. And this picture is of Buenos Aires. And they prospered during the Depression and the World War II when the U.S. couldn't concentrate on the industry and the economy, but they would have to improve to be competitive with the post-war period. So that's, that's it for chapter 8, and that's it for this week, and I'll post chapter 9 next week. Keep studying!